Welcome, everybody. I'm Rabbi Avram Goldhar from goldharschool.com, uh, the home of big picture Jewish education. And tonight, I want to thank Project Inspire for inviting me to be part of this MindFlex series. This is the third in the series. The first one had technical difficulties. Yesterday was a crash course on Jewish holidays, and today is a crash course on Jewish spirituality. You know, I, uh, a number of years ago, my oldest daughter at the time uh, was in a supermarket. She was five years old. And she'd seen one of the workers in the supermarket, a very tall, lanky guy, must have been about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and she looked up at him and she said, wow, you are so tall. And he kind of just shrugged his shoulders. And she said, like, how old are you? You know, and from a child's perspective, you know, they think that, you know, just the older you get, the taller you get. But the reality is that physically we stop maturing uh, when we hit a certain age, but when our physical growth starts to slow down, that's when our spiritual growth really kicks in. And life is really not about who we are on the outside, our physical nature, it's really about who we are on the inside, the choices we make, the character we develop, and the direction we set for ourselves in life. So spirituality really is the essence of life, and yet it's something that needs to be understood well to be able to really develop ourselves into the, who we are meant to be and can be uh, as we journey through this uh, wonderful existence called life. So tonight's Crash Course in Jewish Spirituality is going to take a big picture approach to spirituality. So instead of sharing an insight here on one facet, we're going to try to build a composite of what it means to be a spiritual person from a number of different vantage points. And the goal, hopefully, is that you'll walk away with a framework that is very clear and hopefully insightful uh, that will kind of enlighten you in a way that perhaps you've never thought about who you are and what you can do in a very practical way. So it's not something which is just in their head or just in our heart, but it's something which is something the way that we, we walk and do and think in a very practical terms. So what we're gonna do and how it works is I'm gonna introduce a spiritual survey. I'm gonna go to the screen just a moment. I'm gonna put it up. And I'm going to give you a survey. So let me do that right now. And we're going to do this together. Um, I'm going to do it one second. Share the screen. All right, so now here we are. Goldarschool.com, home of Big Picture Jewish Education, the crash course on spirituality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you five pairs of words. One second, my, my uh, computer is jammed here. One second. I'm going to give you five pairs of words. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me which word do you associate more to being spiritual. So there's going to be five pairs of words. We'll do one pair at a time. I'm going to ask you which word in the pair do you associate with more, with being more, um, associate more to being spiritual? And again, there's no right answers. Whatever you think, it's not a trick question, just whatever you associate more to being a spiritual person. So here goes. I'm going to go through the five pairs. And then once you take your internal kind of vote, your selection, we'll go back and we're going to review this together and see what we come up with. Okay, here we go. So which word do you associate more to being spiritual? Emotion or intellect? Emotion or intellect? Which would you associate more to being spiritual? That's the first pair. Now we'll go to the second pair. Which word do you associate more to being spiritual? Kindness or justice? Kindness or justice? Okay. All right, now let's go to our third pair. Third pair is, which word do you associate more to being spiritual? Community or solitude? Community or solitude? Okay, now let's go to our fourth pair. Which word do you associate more to being spiritual, God or nature? God or nature? Okay, and now we're going to go to our final pair. Which word do you associate more to being spiritual? Serenity or challenge? Serenity or challenge? Okay, those are the five pairs of words. Hopefully you've had a moment to reflect and think about which of these, each of these pair of uh, words which word do you associate more to being spiritual? Now we're going to go through this together. Now, if we had an interactive type of thing, I would actually ask you in the chat uh, what the words are. I could see your, your votes and what you went with. So what I'm going to do here, we're going to review this, and I'll share the experience I've had with many people 
as we go through it together. So here we are. Which word do you associate more to being spiritual? When it came to emotion or intellect, so I've done this with you know, presentations all around the nation and um, overseas. So when I ask people which word do you associate more to being spiritual, most people, most people tell me they associate emotions more to spirituality. Emotion. Second pair was kindness or justice. Which word do most people associate to being spiritual? Most people chose kindness. Most people chose kindness. All right, which word did you associate more to being spiritual? Community or solitude? So this one, it depends on the community and you know, who I'm presenting to, but a lot of people, in my experience, uh, in doing this in seminars, a lot of people say solitude. Yes, it's good to be with people, but it's something about being with yourself uh, in your own skin, so to speak, solitude. Then when it comes to God or nature, it's a toss up. Now here it really is, it, it swings back and forth. A lot of people though, uh, have told me that they associate spirituality to nature, right? Someone's connected to nature, uh, very wholesome. And then finally, when it came to serenity or challenge, which word do most people associate to being spiritual? Most people associate serenity, serenity. Now, this doesn't have to be your selections. You may have completely, chose completely differently, but this is the overall composite uh, of a picture of a person being spiritual from many presentations I've done from people, is that a spiritual person is very emotionally connected, very good-hearted. Uh, they're kind as a result, and they're connected to people. Um, they're very comfortable, as I said, when it comes to solitude. They're very, very, uh, I don't know, self-contained. Not necessarily does that mean alone, or but they're very comfortable sort of being with themselves. They're very in touch with nature and the world around them. And there's a certain serenity, a certain sense of inner balance that strikes you when you meet someone who's very spiritual. You wouldn't meet, expect to see someone, you know, in a tizzy, <laughs> uh, out of sorts. Uh, someone who's very spiritual, you expect them to have a perspective that provides a certain serenity. Right? And uh, so that's a, that's a picture we get. That's the first step here to our survey. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you another survey. This time, I'm going to give you five pairs of words, and I want you to identify which of these words you associate this time more to Jews, to Jews. Okay, here goes. So, which word do you associate more to Jews? Emotion or intellect? Emotion or intellect? All right, now here, I'm going to tell you what the answer I get most of the time is. Most people tell me intellect. Right, that's usually weighted to the side of intellect. Then, which word do most people associate to uh, Jews? Kindness or justice? Kindness or justice? So here again, my experience has been most people answer justice. Jews are into causes. Justice, fighting for what's right. Then we have, which word do you associate more to Jews? Now this is fascinating because when I've done this presentation, I've done it many, many times. It's, it's almost unanimous or unanimous, really is unanimous in all the presentations, when it comes to Jews, everybody says community. Everybody says community, which is fascinating. It's, it's the only thing we agree on is that we're all into community, and that's where the uh, unity ends. Uh, but when it comes to Jews, we think of community. Then when it comes to God or nature, uh, most people say they think of God as opposed to nature. And then when it comes to serenity or challenge, serenity or challenge, when it comes to Jews, most people think of challenge, challenge. So. Let's put up the, um, the choices here. And it's fascinating uh, what arises uh, when we do the survey, is that typically, typically, the answers are the exact opposite, right? What people sense is uh, spiritual, the opposite they, assent, they uh, associate with Jews, which means one of two things. It either means that the Jews are the least spiritual people in the world, uh, because we're on the opposite end of the spectrum, or, it means that we have a very different notion of what it means to be spiritual. And therefore, it's something we should look at because we're really very different than what most people tend to um, associate with spirituality. And I would like to suggest that there must be something we're doing right because we've been around for 3,300 years as a nation. And that, that it's typifies or it's a... Um, symptom of 
the fact that then we must be connected in some way to the, the flow of this world and the fact that we'd be able to maintain ourselves despite all the turbulence that we've been in, uh, far, far more successful throughout history than many nations much greater, more, more powerful and more numerous than us. So let's take a look at the, this, uh, these two, this survey here and analyze it step by step. And let's see if we can come up with a, a portrait, a uh, framework for understanding the Jewish notion to spirituality. So I'm going to, give me a moment, click out of the share. One second. So I click out of the share. How do I do that? Oh, here we go. Okay, here we are. So let's go step by step, and, excuse me, and, and understand uh, what's going on, why uh, we answered typically, again, I'm assuming, but many, many people, not everybody may have said when it came to each pair, one side and the other side was what we associate to Jews. So let's do it step by step. So, First of all, most people I've met have associate, when it came to emotion or intellect, they associate emotion much more to spirituality than intellect. And when I ask people why, the answers I get uh, make a lot of sense because you expect a spiritual person to be a feeling person, you know, connected to something higher. And in a way, spirituality is something which is transcendent. It goes beyond logic. It's metaphysical. And therefore, you'd expect your heart to be very much the conduit and the, the form of connection to a spiritual world. You have to have feelings. Um, so that's why many people associate emotion. And again, these aren't uh, mutually exclusive. Really, in each pair of words, both facets play a role. But it's very fascinating that when I ask people where would we associate the soul, Judaism, we believe that there's a body and a soul. We have a physical reality, and then we also have a spiritual makeup which is the soul, the neshama. And when I ask people, where in the body do you associate the neshama, the soul of a person? Most people point to the heart. Uh, but the reality is, and from Jewish tradition, we don't associate the heart to the soul. Uh, we associate it to the head. The seat of the soul is the mind. The awareness and what you have, the seat of the soul is in your mind. And in fact, in our prayer that we say, twice a day, and then once before we go to bed at night, the Shema prayer, sort of like the, the national anthem of the Jewish people, uh, we say in the first paragraph, uh, we say in the third paragraph of that prayer, a very interesting line about the heart. It says, do not follow after your eyes or your heart. All right, fascinating. Don't follow after your eyes or your heart because your heart is not reliable. Your heart is always seeking connection to something. It wants to feel, it wants excitement. And therefore you can't rely on your heart in terms of uh, making decisions uh, from the get-go, at least always go with your heart, it can be very, very misleading. And we've had many people, you sure you know some, that you know, ruined their lives because they, they, they allowed a moment where the heart took them someplace where they shouldn't have gone, and they ended up losing a lot of things that they knew that they were much more important and they shouldn't have done in the head, but the heart led them. So then our tradition, the seed of the soul is the mind. And that's why it's uh, very important to, um, to understand what makes the soul strong in the mind. There's a book that was written uh, from the uh, Middle Ages by a rabbi named Ibn Ben Bakuda. And it's a very systematic breakdown of kind of Jewish growth and Jewish understanding of life. And he talks about the conflict between the body and the soul. Right? There's a part of us the body that's always feeling like it wants certain things, it wants to eat, it wants to live through the senses. So it's always living in the here and now. And the soul is very transcendent. It's looking for things which are not physical, material in nature. It's going for things which are, you know, abstract in notion, giving and contribution and, and love and, and harmony and things which you can't necessarily see in the, in the most physical way. And we're always in conflict between the two. But he points out in this book a fascinating thing. He says 
that our bodies have three advantages over our souls. Uh, and therefore, the body kind of gets a head start and becomes much stronger. And that's why it's harder to choose things which are soulful in nature. And he says the following. He says, first of all, the body gets a head start because when you come into this world as a young infant and even as a child, your, your mind isn't really developed. You haven't developed the maturity. So while you're a physical being, you're living and you're strength and you're using that muscle uh, all the time, your, your developed thinking and thoughts and your ability to make choices and follow through on those choices and those decisions is something which takes you know, many years to get to. So first of all, the body gets a major head start over the soul. Secondly, he says that any muscle you use, the more you use it, the, uh, the stronger it gets, the stronger it gets. So if you think about the body, the body body's always in motion. You know, whether we're, we're sleeping or we're, we're awake or, you know, whatever we're doing, our body's at, at work. And therefore, it's always being fortified uh, by its own existence. And it's getting stronger. Our soul, if you think about it being in the mind, only gets exercised when you think. By only when you think and you're conscious and you're aware and you're, you're making decisions and you're trying to understand things, only then is your soul in motion. And therefore that's why in our tradition, learning is so essential to the development of a person in a, in a spiritual way because the soul needs inputs and needs ideas and needs wisdom. It needs understanding of this world to be able to navigate and make the correct decisions as we move through life. So that's the second major advantage is that the body is always being strengthened. It's the soul only gets strengthened when we think. And thirdly, he says that our physical reality is always being uh, reinforced by our outer reality, right? Everything you see right now is physical in nature. So that also reinforces the sense that I'm physical. When rea anything that's spiritual in nature, you can't see. It's, it's intangible. And therefore, again, the soul needs to work we need to understand that the things that are deeper, that are beneath the surface in life, right? When we look at relationships, we can't take things on the surface. We have to think beyond and, and, and kind of see and read between the lines. Well, that's a soulful effort. So the first thing when it comes to emotion or intellect, we're going to see here that, again, it's not that it's one without the other. The reality is you need, obviously, emotions and you need the intellect. But the way Judaism understands the, the relationship is that the intellect is what guides our emotions. And the goal in life, from a Jewish perspective, is what we have to develop what we call realized emotions. A realized emotion is where you take an idea that you know is true, and yet you don't necessarily feel it in your physical being, and then to bring that idea, make it so much a part of you, you actually feel it, and it becomes your way of life. So for example, just a, a very simple example, someone who uh, understands they shouldn't you know, smoke, so we all know that, uh, well, we shouldn't smoke. It's, it's harmful, uh, with terrible consequences. But someone's a smoker and knows how hard it is to give it up. But once someone gives it up, or at least many people that do give it up, once they've, you know, passed that threshold, then going back, they realize, like, a healthy way of life is much better. Here's a, probably a better example, just exercise. When you haven't exercised for a while, the body's fighting, you know, tooth and nail to keep you still and, and not to... Uh, not to exercise, but once you're in a routine of exercise, and all of a sudden the body wants you to get to the gym and wants you to go outside and get to work and uh, strengthen yourself. So the body follows suit with ideas, but the goal is to realize, take, allow the soul to take the ideas we know to be true and then to de uh, develop a life around those ideas, you know, take action, and then the body will eventually follow suit. Another example, one more, is that, you know, Jewish tradition, you can't speak negatively about someone. The laws of Russian and horror, they're a fascinating area of Jewish law, but you can't speak negatively. So, you know, I've spoken to many people that have never been familiar with those laws. And when they learn out you can't gossip in Judaism, the first question they always ask is like, what am I going to talk about? Like, it's hard to imagine any social interaction when you're not, you know, taking a dig at someone. Uh, but the reality is anybody who's ever gotten used to not speaking Russian or negatively about anybody, uh, after a while, and you live in a community where that's the community standard, then when you hear someone speak Lush Noir, speak negatively um, about someone, it's jarring. It's, it's uncomfortable. Uh, so the goal here, the first step, is to develop what we call 
realize emotions. Take the intellect and then allow the intellect to infuse your, your physical awareness and reality, but it takes action and allowing the body to accustom and culturate to the, the truthfulness of the ideas that you know you should follow. So that's step number one. All right, so let's go to the second pair of words, which is kindness or justice. Now, I think it's pretty obvious we'd think of kindness as a, uh, and by the way, I just want to say one last thing on emotional intellect. We say in the Shema prayer, the very opening is, you should love the Almighty with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your possessions. It's all about love. It is all about emotions at the end of the day, but you're not going to love the Almighty if you're loving yourself and everything that's around you and you're giving in and not being who you could be. So, but the goal is ultimately to live a life that's totally fulfilled with, you know, filled with passion, but it's passion toward the things that are really deserve your uh, attention. All right, so it's kindness and, and justice. So when it comes to kindness and justice, I pin many people choose kindness, and it makes sense because a spiritual person, you would expect to be a good-hearted person, that they're, they're not uh, in, you know, insensitive to someone else or uncaring or cold-hearted. Um, there should be a lot of kindness. And we do believe, you know, our founding father, Abraham, was the patriarch that represented kindness. His tent was open on all four sides. And we believe this world was founded on kindness. So clearly, kindness is a, uh, you know, a, a foundation point for a pillar of a spiritual existence, no doubt. But when it comes to justice, justice plays a very important role in terms of the dynamic to kindness. And uh, the way to bring this out is there's a question that really everybody has to ask, uh, or in some ways answered for themselves, even if they've consciously asked this question, which is, is the world a perfect place? And therefore, uh, our job as people is not to ruin it. Uh, or is this world an imperfect place? And our job is to make it perfect. It's a very fundamental question. What is your place in the world? What is this world that you've been placed into? Is it a perfect place? And therefore, our job is not to mess it up. Or is it an imperfect world? And your, our job is to repair it or bring it to its uh, perfection. So from a Jewish point of view, we definitely believe this world is an imperfect place. That we are intentionally put in a world by the Almighty that is not fully developed. And we have a very special role as people to help bring out the perfection, to help build and repair it and bring out the, the full potential that exists in this world. And the place where we see that fundamentally as Jews, is in the bris of uh, circumcision, the covenant of circumcision. You know, it's a very unusual thing to be circumcised. And of all things, you know, why do we circumcise ourselves on the part of the body that we do? Uh, so we say our tradition teaches the reason why the covenant of the Jews and our connection to God is through circumcision is we say that the Almighty left over a little bit of skin. Uh, and our job is to complete ourselves by taking that off and making ourselves complete. And therefore, if on our physical beings, there's room for us to actually bring out the completion in who we are, then all the more so in the spiritual realm, this world is incomplete and our job and the bris of circumcision is to recognize as a people that our job is to bring this out, this perfection out. And that's why the sailing, which is well known, it's part of our prayers, uh, but it's become very popular in the Jewish world, tikkun olam, fixing the world, is fundamental to the Jewish people. Well, to fix the world, that means there's wrongs that need to be righted. There's injustices that you have to stand up against. And therefore, from a Jewish point of view, justice is a necessary forefront of our activities because kindness can be to anyone. Kindness is almost, uh, you, can, you can be kind and justify kindness uh, to any type of person, which is good to a point, but the reality is the world will never get where it needs to get to if we don't recognize there are wrongs and there's injustices or there are things, problems in the world that need solutions, and the Almighty made us in His image to be able to think about what the solutions are, and that's our partnership with Him. And therefore, when it comes to uh, justice and kindness, I would like to suggest that, of course, both of them are essential to our spiritual makeup. Clearly, someone who's kind is, is good in spirit a thousand percent. But in terms of a dynamic, 
there needs to be, I'd say the, the pathways, justice creates a world of kindness. There's a saying in our tradition that he who is kind to the cruel will ultimately become cruel to the kind. Once again, he is cruel to the kind, kind to the cruel will be cruel, ultimately become cruel to the kind. And the meaning is that you can rationalize why you should be kind to everybody. You know, the person who did a dastardly deed or destroyed buildings or, uh, you know, rob people, or we could always look at someone and say, wow, they just need a lot of love and a lot of kindness. And, and there's ways to justify it. But if we don't realize at the same time, hey, we need to have a world that works. There needs to be law and order. There needs to be a justice system so that there's a clear sense of boundaries between what's mine and what's yours, what's right and what's wrong, then society will fall apart. So in terms of the pathway, once again, I'd like to suggest that a world of justice creates the environment that where kindness can really thrive in, a, in, in the most healthy way. And that's the relationship between the two, again, in a broad sense. Okay, so now we've done emotion and intellect and kindness and justice. Let's go to the third pair. The third pair was community or solitude, community or solitude. Well, many people chose uh, solitude. Again, when I've done this, a lot of people choose community as well, so it's not a unanimous by no means, but uh, a lot of people choose solitude. And the reason is because we often get the picture of someone very spiritual, uh, you know, meditating, uh, very comfortable being in their own skin, and, um, and that's our notion. Uh, but when it comes to Jews, we definitely associate being, to, uh, being connected to the community. So why is it? Why is the community sense so developed amongst the Jewish people. It's so much part of our, our makeup as a society that we think about in these terms. So if you think about what we just said about justice and a world of uh, setting a world that make a world perfect, well, how do you make a world perfect? You can either do it on your own or you can do it with others. Well, if you take the job seriously, if you really believe that the, our goal is to bring about a perfect world, then you want to do with others. You want to be able to bring about that perfection with everybody because you need everybody on board. And the more people that are involved, the more talent, the more resources, the more minds, the more um, skill, I mean, the, the more, the better. And that's why from a Jewish point of view, community is essential. You cannot accomplish your purpose uh, living on your own, uh, being completely isolated. Uh, excuse me. You, uh, you need to have others. In fact, you know, I remember that uh, once I was, I was in New York, uh, Manhattan, I walked into a building and I was about to teach a class and the person that I uh, was teaching a class for introduced me to his son who was uh, in his mid-20s at the time. And he said, oh, I want to introduce you to Rabbi Goldar. I said, hello, I said, hello. He says, oh, hi, you know, hi, Rabbi. And he said, you know, I, I just want to tell you, I, I'm not into organized religion. And uh, truthfully, those two words don't really ring a bell for me either. Organized religion, it's just not, it's, I wouldn't say like I'm into organized religion. Those two words just don't um, resonate with me. But uh, I said to him, he worked for a hedge fund. I said, uh, let me ask you, you know, do you, uh, you work for this hedge fund? Uh, how's the company? You know, is it successful? Good, is it organized? Yes. You know, you have an analyst, you have your... You, you know, fund manager, you have the people in the back office, the IT, yes. Is it organized? Yes, because in order to, in this case, make money through investments, you want to be organized. If you want to find a cure for cancer, you want to have a lab, and you want to have scientists, and you want technicians, and you want technology, and there's so many things that go into finding one cure to one cancer, but you want to be organized. In fact, the more organized you are, uh, is identifies you as more purposeful because people who have a strong sense of purpose realize that everything matters and therefore they want to put everything together. So we as a people believe that we have a role to play as Jews to bring about a major change, to be a light unto nations. Well, we're only going to be a light unto nations if we are, as a nation, produce that light together as one. And therefore, when it comes to the two facets of community and solitude, I'd like to suggest that community is kind of the forefront, but it creates the environment and the setting and the context for solitude. Meaning when we go and we pray, if you looked at a Jewish prayer book, so you'll see that the prayers are in 
um, second person plural. It's always about us and we. But the height, the, the, the most intense moments of a prayer service is when you step into the silent prayer, the Amida prayer, and you're praying one-to-one -one with the Almighty. When you see yourself with a lot of other people, um, you know, you get, you get a sense of who you are. But in the end of the day, that'll bring out who you are. And uh, just on another note on this is that in solitude, well, who are you with? You know, you can be with nature. Uh, you can be on the top of a mountain. You can be in a, you know, in a beautiful setting or by the ocean. And you can be connecting to the world around you. But if you really want to get to know yourself in many different ways, then just be around people. Because people make you grow in so many different ways that you never thought about. Because you, relationships are by nature rich. They're dynamic. And every person brings out different facets and requires different parts of you. And one of the things that I think is most powerful about uh, Jewish, the Jewish way of life and community life in general is that when you go to services on Shabbat and you're part of a community, it's a very different thing than when you're part of a family and an office or a school. Uh, when you go as part of a community, so you have people of all ages, children to, to, uh, to grandparents and great-grandparents, uh, so you have people of all ages. You're connected to some people very closely, some people you aren't at all. But when you're part of a community, you're part of everybody's life, and you play a role in some facets, sometimes more with others, of course. But if there's a great occasion, a wedding or a bar mitzvah, then you're part of that. And you contribute to the joy and the simcha that happens there. If there's a loss, uh, you go to the shiva. Even if you're not so close, you can go to the shiva because your presence lets the person know that you're recognizing the loss and you want to be there to support them some way. So community makes you, uh, expand you in a way that, someone just alone will never be expanded. They might be getting in touch with parts of them uh, with through, you know, through intense focus, but they're never going to experience things that are going to come out that can't be achieved just through mere focus in the way that a person brings them out in you. So that's why community ultimately gives you the greatest chance to know yourself and therefore be in solitude. All right, so that's the, uh, the third pair. So now let's go to God and nature, God and nature. So again, here it's a, it's a split. Uh, people, um, you know, depending on the group, some people choose more God, others nature. But many people choose nature. And again, that's because uh, someone who's spiritual is sensitive and they're aware and they're connected and they're, they're not rushing through life. Um, someone said to me that they went to a... Uh, a, uh, a spiritual experience where, where there was, wasn't a lot of talking. There was eating, you know, eating grains and a lot of chewing and, um, and just being in touch, you know, uh, in a very beautiful setting. But um, it's very interesting in the way that we understand the relation to God in nature is that uh, we call this world in Hebrew an olam. Right? We say in a blessing, blessed are you, you know, Baruch Hashem, King of the world, the universe. The olam is the universe. In Hebrew, the word olam, the root of it is ne'elam, which means hidden. Because we believe this universe ultimately hides the Almighty's presence. The creator of the universe is hidden. He's veiled by the natural world. And therefore, while as the natural world is remarkably compelling and magnificent and beautiful and intricate, the reality is behind it, there's something much deeper, which is the creator who put you here for some reason. And therefore, yes, a thousand percent, someone should be connected to nature and appreciate from the moment they wake up, from the birds chirping. Uh, right now, I'm, you know, every morning I go out to a minion to pray. It's in uh, a rabbi's backyard, and it's just lovely. Just the birds are chirping, and the, there's dew on the ground, and, and it, it's very, very... Uh, helpful to, uh, to my prayers. It's been, it's been a very nice period of time, you know, that we've been through in this sense. Uh, but there's something more, which is, what am I here for? What, 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 why, what am I meant to achieve here? And there's an important uh, principle that in Judaism, we don't believe that anything's accidental. Everything is here for a reason. And everything that's happening there, there's no coincidence. 
And therefore, if something happened to us, the question that we have to ask ourselves most often is, what does the Almighty want? Like he's here, he's hidden, but what does he want from my choice now? What's the, the growth that he's asking me to do? What's the, the contribution that I can make in this moment? What's the mitzvah that I can do? That's not evident from the, the material world, but behind it, there's a spiritual opportunity. And, uh, and therefore, it's, um, it behooves us to recognize that as beyond, as beyond the magnificence of the world is the, is, the, is the absolute beyond creator that's behind it. You know, I, it's uh, a little while back, I watched a video of one of the founders of the mindfulness movement. I believe his name is John Kabat-Zinn. Um, I hope I'm getting that right. Uh, but he's the founder of the mindfulness movement, which has had a tremendous impact on many people's lives. So I was watching this lecture. He was giving at the, I believe it was the University of Finland. And he, he starts the lecture. He's at the lectern. And he says, um, I want to ask you, um, I want to ask you a question. You know, three questions. First of all, my question I want to know is, why are you here? Why are you here? Like, what, what brought you here? Did you see a poster? Someone told you about it? What was the topic that drew you? Like, why, why are you here? Okay, so he gave people a few moments to think about that. And he says, now I want to ask you a second question. Second question is like, why are you really here? Why are you really here? You know, I thought that was, that was very clever. Right? Because beyond whatever that was on our mind that we're conscious of, you know, the fact is that we're here at this moment in time, in a very, you know, brief life, as we, you know, when you're through, you think about it, there's something that drew you here, that brought you here. That's, so what is that? And that takes more ponderance. And they say, I want to ask you one last question. Why are you really, really here? You know, and that's a deep question. And uh, I think it takes a few, more than a few moments to, to, to consider that. It may take a lot of time, and some people may not even be able to answer that question. So I thought that was a, a brilliant presentation, a brilliant introduction to this topic on mindfulness. Uh, but I'd like to suggest something from a Jewish point of view, which is the question of why are you here, you will never be able to answer just from, on your own. I mean, why are you really here? Well, you didn't ask to come here. None of us chose existence. We just sort of like, ta-da, here we are, spank, you know, spank on, on the behind, and boom, we're here. You know, we didn't ask for this existence, we're here. And it, it takes a while before we under, even understand where we are. So why are we really here? The answer to that question is the Almighty. We're put here for a reason. And that's why uh, the most important question is like, why are we really here? Connecting to God, the, the creator, and recognizing this world, this olam, is really hidden. But that what makes it even more fascinating is that the brilliant wisdom that made the world so spectacular, part of that wisdom is a brilliant answer to the question why you specifically are here. But that can only come through relationship with God and asking him, why am I here? What do you want from me? What am I here to achieve? And therefore, again, being able to, in terms of the two, God and nature, it really is starting with God makes you even more aware and more present in this world that we're in because the clues to our existence and the purpose of our existence is around us. So you become more heightenedly aware of looking and searching and, and trying to figure out what are you experiencing in your life that can help you, therefore discern your particular path. And therefore the world becomes more than just a mere backdrop, but it becomes a necessary necessary um, source of, of answers and solutions that can help you, provided you keep asking God, why are we here? Because he wants us to have the answer, because he wants us to be fulfilled. That's my Jewish point of view. So having a relation with God will give you a much more transcendent relationship to nature, I like to suggest. Now I want to conclude with the last one, serenity or challenge? Serenity or challenge? Well, most people, as I said, you know, choose uh, serenity. Uh, because as I mentioned, you know, we have like the serenity prayer of the 12 steps. You know, serenity is what you hope for for someone who's developed. Spirit, being spiritual requires a maturity. And again, someone's not going to be imbalanced or, or uh, in a tizzy or, or anxious. Or there's going to be a certain calmness that comes from recognizing that it's not about this moment. I can be in control. I can be composed. 
because I'm not alone here. I have the Almighty, and there's a reason why I'm in this situation, and therefore my question is, what do I do now? What does he want from me? So serenity makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I want to share something. You know, when uh, we have large Shabbos tables, and we have a lot of people at our tables, so, you know, there's times when we ask, you know, a question. We go around the room, and, and people answer the question. So one of the questions I've asked is, and I'll ask you, is where have you grown more in your life? from the times when everything was serene or when you were going through challenges. And in this case, it's almost unanimous that everybody says it's the challenges, right? It's fascinating. We, we grow so much more through challenges than when everything's just, you know, even keeled. And yet we do so much, so much of our, our energies are spent on like, avoid the challenges, you know, avoid the obstacles, you know, oh no, I don't want to have a day you know, uh, riddled with challenges. I want a day that's just going to go easy. But the fact of the matter is that challenges are part and parcel to our growth because, again, if the soul is here to understand in the mind and we're here to perfect the world and we're here to do it together and we recognize the world's imperfect, so by nature, we're in a place of challenge. Right? That's the only way the soul can grow is through being challenged. And therefore, you'll never be yourself if you run away from challenge. Who you can be, and that's why so many of, you know, the, the great stories of this world, the great, you know, biographies, uh, the movies of people who, 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 you know, overcame some remarkable challenge, there are heroes. You know, I once heard a, a wonderful lecture where uh, someone had asked the rabbi, why is it when I watch inspiring video, you know, movies of someone who overcame tremendous you know, all odds, and they overcame the challenges. Why do I cry? The person asked. Why do I cry when I see that? When I just cheer? And the answer the rabbi gave is because your soul knows that's you, that you're here to also overcome and to strive and not just look for even. You'll never be yourself if you don't, you know, tackle the day and make more of yourself. But the only way you can make more of yourself is getting beyond yourself. You know, if you can imagine, I remember there's a, a famous um, address that was given at a commencement. I'm not sure who said it, but it was, you know, every day do one thing that you're fearful of. And I thought that was very, very powerful. You know, most of us live circumscribed by, let's say, a circle. We live in a circle, and that circle is us. It's everything we're familiar about us. You know, I do this, I don't do that, I like this, I don't like that. It's everything I know about myself and what I think I can do, and what I'm certain that I can't do, that's me. And that's the circle we live in. But the reality is, that's not us, right? The us that we, we truly are, we'll never know, and will we make important choices to go beyond and overcome the fears and, and do the things that we, we don't think we'll be comfortable with, but we know we should do. And when you do them, you feel like a million dollars, and you realize this is me, and that's why the stories inspire us because uh, we inspire others when we do these things because we all want to feel the endorsement that we can overcome the challenge. And the reality is, in terms of a pathway, the only time you will ever feel totally serene is when you overcome your challenges, right? When you overcome a challenge, then you feel serene because you're more yourself. It's bringing you back to who you are meant to be, but you'll never discover you're meant to be if you're just standing still. And therefore the Almighty put us in a world of tremendous challenges with a lot of perfection, a lot of imperfections, and, uh, and sometimes his eyes breaking down and you're scratching your head. But our job as Jews is not to sit here on the sidelines and say, okay, okay, society's going to unravel. Uh-uh, that's not us. We have to put our thinking caps on, work together and with others to figure out how do we bring this world about to its senses and overcome all the, 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 the divides that are so strong and barriers are so thick uh, and yet come together, well, there's a way. And if we don't know the way, okay, well, let's think. That's why we have life, is to think in a godly way. And therefore, again, it's serenity is only achieved through challenge. Challenge is the way to come to serenity. Ultimately, in so much that every day is meant to be a day of growth, there's going to be challenges. And really, the ultimate serenity will only happen <laughs> after 120 years. But we get the taste of serenity, and that's why Shabbat, the Sabbath day, is a day of serenity, a day of tranquility, a day of Hebrew is called menucha, just a sense of rest 
Because six days you're meant to be out there battling and growing and changing and doing work, real work, not just steady work, not just mediocre work, but, uh, mediocre work, but great work. When you get to the Sabbath, you get the Shabbat, then you get that sense of serenity that, okay, no more work to do. Now I can just be me as I know I am in the world that I've created for myself and for my family and for others. That's me. And that's what the Sabbath day helps us get a taste of. It's really the next world that the true serenity will be. But Shabbat is a, is a uh, taste, an analog for that. And therefore, to review what we've done so far, it's done in this crash course in spirituality, is we have now a portrait. That first and foremost, when it comes to emotion or intellect, of course, both are very important facets, the equation of being spiritual. But we're suggesting that the starts with the intellect and the goal is to have realized emotions, not to have primitive emotions, not just to go with your emotions, but go with what's truthful, what you know is right, and then live your life according to principles and you will come, your body will follow suit. And when it follows suit and gets there, it's gonna feel like a million dollars and will not relate to the, the, the superficial pleasures that, uh, that compromise who we are and what we want to make of ourselves. So it starts with the, the intellect and realizing emotions and therefore the only way to strengthen our intellect is through learning. And that's why Torah learning, it's a commandment to, to do it every day in the morning and the evening because there's really no time of day that you, you're not meant to be growing and thinking and getting new ideas. And we're living constantly with a deficit. I mean, there's so much more knowledge and wisdom outside and therefore we need to feed ourselves through learning. And therefore I'd like to suggest that there is a book that you have next to your bed or wherever you are, but read a page a day some, uh, from the Torah, from a book of wisdom, something that's giving your mind more to think about because that's giving your soul more strength and the reinforcement it needs to tackle the body and bring it in un, un, under, its, uh, under its rule. Secondly, kindness or justice, obviously both. We're meant to be kind like Abraham, just like Isaac, but we have to recognize this world is an imperfect place from a Jewish point of view. We entered a covenant with the Almighty, and therefore our job is to perfect it. That's the space we've been given. It's a precious space. It's a tremendous privilege, but you have to have a cause. And, and you should, you know, if you do not have something which you're, part of a cause, you know, a cure for something or something that's going on, there's plenty of needs. You know, there's a, a cute saying, a cute riddle, which is what's the difference between dogs and cats? So the um, dogs say, these people, they love me, they can't take care of me, they shelter me, they give me so much attention, they must be gods. And then a cat says, these people, they love me, they take care of me, they shelter me. They give me so much attention. We must be gods, right? It's a very different perspective. Same, same uh, input, but a very different outcome. So similarly, you can look at this world as, you know, big world, so much happening, so many problems. Who am I to make a difference? Or you can say this world is so big, so many problems, so many people. Who am I not to make a difference? How can I not make a difference? I, there's so much room to make a difference, but clearly the, we, we need to all step up and fight for what's right and for justice and, and not let others, um, assume that others are gonna take up the mantle for us because it's not just for them, it's for us to do it. Uh, and that's gonna provide the safest and most secure environment for people to be kind to one another where a society can still function with law and order. Thirdly, when it comes to community and solitude, you gotta be part of a community. You know, if you, if uh, you know, it's, one should always think about expanding if you're part of a, uh, a shul, a synagogue, a, an organization, something where you're part of the year, more input from others to get something accomplished because you need more people to accomplish great things in life to be part of it. And that's where you will ultimately, when you put your, you know, kept me down on the pillow at night, you'll feel yourself the most because you're getting to know yourself the most by being involved in relationships with others. When it comes to God or nature, you're living in a, a universe that's called the Olam. It's now love. It's hidden, right? The Almighty is, is veiled behind it. But there's a reason why you're here. And the only way you'll ever understand is by asking the question to the Almighty, why am I here? What do you want? Why am I really here? Really? You know, beyond the nine to five, beyond the, the, uh, the simple dreams. What do you really want from me? Ask the question. And that'll put you in a world that is, so alive and so real that as magnificent, beautiful it is and, and full of wonder, 
nonetheless, it also has the clues to your own existence that you'll find uh, in the world around you to help you know, answer that question. And, third, and finally, when it comes to surrendering your challenge, yes, the Almighty wants us to be serene, but the only way the soul will ever feel serene and our spiritual lives will ever be fulfilled is if we rise to the challenge. And that's what makes, uh, I think, the Jewish people, going back to the original question of why we're around after 3,300 years, is we've never shied away from rising to the challenge. Uh, no matter how hard the challenges are, no matter what we've been through, nothing stops us uh, because we know that deep down, you know, evil is not as strong as good. And it's temporary. It doesn't, it doesn't stand. It doesn't have legs ultimately. You know, any, any evil enterprise ultimately collapses and we keep going on. But we have to do our part. We have to rise to the challenge and make every day count. And therefore, as we conclude this crash course in spirituality, hopefully you'll keep all these five points in mind, these five pathways to spiritual existence uh, in mind and, uh, and therefore enrich yourself every day by what you learn, what you do, what you do the cause you're involved, the people and community you're a part of, the connection to the Almighty that put you here in the first place that can only really answer the question why you're here, and to give you all the understanding and awareness you need to rise to the challenge, to be yourself and discover a life that is far beyond what you know of it now, not because, uh, not because of anything other than tomorrow is meant for expansion. So I, I hope this has been helpful to help create a helpful uh, framework to grow spiritually as a Jew, uh, as a human, and please God, we should all contribute and help this world get to a much better place uh, and as we like to always say, you know, Lashana Habab Yishalim next year in Jerusalem. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you, Project Inspire, for having me. I'm Rabbi Avram Golda from goldharschool.com, home of big picture Jewish education. If you enjoyed this session, you can go to goldharschool.com. I have crash courses on the Torah, Jewish history, uh, the Jewish holidays, our tradition, very big picture videos that are short, sweet, and map out in a, a way, a context so that someone who doesn't have a lot of Jewish knowledge or missed out on a formal Jewish education can catch up very, very quickly in a very, very systematic, helpful, and empowering way. This is Rabbi Avram Goldhar from goldhardschool.com, wishing you a great night, great evening, and a wonderful life. Thank you very much for joining.